Good morning, everyone. Well, we had a little bit of rain last night and a little bit of wind, but thank the good Lord we did not have what they had in, in um, Iowa. I guess, what, there was a hurricane? Not hurricane, a tornado. Boy, that would have been something, but uh, the tornado, unfortunately, um, caused some deaths near, near Des Moines. So we pray for all of them, and we're just grateful that even though as we head back into a little bit of winter, we had the, the taste of spring, and we know it is definitely coming sooner than later. So we can be grateful for that. Glad that you're here this morning. Welcome to those who are joining us at home as well. And we are grateful to be able to share in the worship of God with you today. Go over a few announcements um, this week in terms of the things that are not as the normal things that are going on. On Monday, we have an education committee at 6.30 here at the church in Cushing Hall. On Tuesday, March 8th, we've got Staff Parish at 5.30. On Wednesday, we have the first of our Lenten studies. Now, this will be on Zoom as well as in person in Cushing Hall. So I, for those who have signed up, I will be sending an email out with the Zoom link as well. But you are more than welcome to come to Cushing Hall too. If you have not gotten your book yet, please see me after the service, if at all possible, and I will get you that book. You do not need to have read it for the first session, but if you would like to have it, I will get it to you um, as, as I'm able to after this service or even on Monday. Let's see, a few other things. A big thank you to the First Christian Church, to Malden UMC, and those here at um, Princeton First. As we joined together on Ash Wednesday of this week, we, as I said last night, I was just flabbergasted. We had 63 people come to the Ash Wednesday service. I know this was an ecumenical service, so there were a couple of other churches, but for the most part, we're lucky if we get 25. So <laughs> I was pretty excited that we had over 60 here, and we were able to collect $265 for the Bureau County Food Pantry. So thank you very much for that. Change the World for March will be donated to the Midwest Mission Distribution Center. This is an ecumenical group that collects things and what they're famous for is their flood buckets. Whenever there are floods in the United States, um, they send these things around um, and allow cleanup to happen in, a, in an expedited manner. So if you're interested, please give um, to the Change the World Fund this month to help that. We are also collecting donations for Second Story, the teen center here in Princeton, and those items are located in the bulletin that was emailed to you or on, um, in the basket. There's a, a picture of each of the things that you could donate. I have to apologize. I misspoke last night when I talked about the electronic sign. We are doing it. We are, not, we are still collecting money for it, but we are going to be able to do the electronic sign. Again, we are grateful to the Memorial Committee for putting down half of the money. But this is uh, um, a sign that is going to replace the one that we have on Peru Street. It is the one that we have now was very generously donated to us, but it is now 25 years old and in need of repair. And so we are now going to be able to have an electronic sign. We would ask that you consider giving a special gift beyond what you normally give to the church if this is something of interest to you. It will also hopefully be able to give a lot more outreach into our community and attract people because we will be able to put up various things during the week of what we're doing and hopefully that will let more people know what we are accomplishing in in our community and around the world. So if you're interested, please um, consider giving um, to that fund with electronic sign in the memo line if you write checks. Marsha will be on vacation. Uh, she's our administrative assistant and she's gonna be on vacation from March 14th to March 18th and still needs a few shifts to be covered um, for um, helping in the office, answering the phone, things like that. So if anyone's interested, please um, let her know. Remember that daylight savings time begins next Sunday. Everyone excited to lose an hour? <clears throat> but we do get more, more, uh, more daylight, which is a wonderful thing. So just remember to set your clocks ahead next Saturday night. Um, a lot of people have been asking about 
the Ukraine situation and how the United Methodists are, are, are helping out with that. We are collecting money for UMCOR and for their international disaster response efforts. So if you're interested, go ahead and you can let us know um, by giving, that, that you care by giving some of these um, monies to the Ukraine offering. And our promise sale is returning, so if those who are um, looking for prom dresses are interested, March 25th and 26th, we will be having the promise sale where all the prom dresses are $50 or less. And so please let anyone who may be accomplishing that or needing to accomplish a dress for that date um, coming up for their high school, let them know that we'll be doing that. So I think those are the announcements for this morning. If you will please bow your heads with me for our focusing prayer, and we'll start our worship of the Lord. God of the past, present, and future, write your truth into our lives this day. As we worship you this first Sunday in the season of Lent, we ask that you be present in our troubles and in our triumphs. Lead us away from temptations, to do things that hurt or simply don't matter, and provide us then with opportunities to do good works for you and others. God, be with us this day as we praise you. Through Christ we pray. Amen. And now I will invite Marg to come forward as she leads us in our responsive call to worship, and if you are able to stand, please do so. Gather to remember and share stories of the faith. Rejoice in the goodness of our loving God. Before, Before our stories ever began, there was God. Through all our days, the one who created us walks with us. Worship the one who gives and sustains life. We sing praises to the Lord, who is our refuge. We, we call out to God, God expecting, expecting to be heard. We listen, knowing there is truth to be received. And if you're able, please remain standing as we join in singing our opening hymn, number 374, the first, second, and fourth verses of Standing on the Promises.
may be seated, all except for Aiden, if you'd like to come forward. And just to let you know, Aiden, Shelley did come in, and she is up in the nursery for you afterwards if you would like to be able to go up there, okay? Okay, so what's the rock for you where you're going to find out, okay? Hannah was here last night for the service, and Miss Charlotte couldn't be here, so you're the only one today. Is that okay? You're stuck just with me. That's all right? Okay, well, I'm glad to hear that. Okay, have you ever been hungry in your life, Aiden? Mm, never, Aiden! Never? You've never been hungry in your life? I have a... F you actually have. Okay, I have a feeling your mom would probably say yes. Now, have you, have you ever heard the phrase, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse? Yes. Yes, okay, well, let's not shout, okay? I, I think we can, well, that's why I've got the microphone, so that we can hear us, okay? So, yes, you've heard the story, or uh, heard the phrase, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse, okay? Is that something that you normally eat? Is horse something you normally have for dinner? Uh. No, you do not have that, okay. Well, the thing is, there are plenty of things that we wouldn't want to eat. What about the stone? Would you want to eat that for dinner? Mm. No, but I don't think you would want that. It, it would probably provide you a good amount of roughage, but I don't think I would want it either. That would be kind of hard to get down through your, through your throat, wouldn't it? It would be hard to chew. It would be really hard to chew. You're right. So do you think there's many nutrients in, our, in a stone either? You think there, well, there might be some minerals. I think there probably are some minerals, but that's about it. So, okay, stones aren't really very good food, not for human beings, at least. Have you ever heard the story of Jesus when he was out in the wilderness and he didn't eat for 40 days straight? What do you think of that? Wow. Wow, exactly. That is a long time to go without eating anything. Now, I have known some people who have, during the season of Lent, they did not eat anything for the entire season of Lent. Can you think of how hard that must be? Do you think you could do that? No, you'd, go, you'd be sleeping most of the time, I have a feeling. Most definitely. So, do you think, Aiden, that at the end of that time, Jesus was hungry enough to eat a horse? I think he probably would have been. But did he? I don't think so. No, he didn't. In fact, at the end of that time, the devil, or Satan, came to him and even said, how about, Jesus, you tell this stone to become a loaf of bread so that you can eat it? What do you think Jesus did with that? He made it into a loaf of bread. He didn't. Do you have any idea why he didn't, even though he was so hungry, do you know why he didn't do that? Because he couldn't. Well, no, I think Jesus definitely could have done that. But he wasn't about to give in to what somebody bad told him to do. He knew that the devil was only telling him that to try and get him to do something that he didn't need to do. It was a temptation. Have you ever been tempted to do something wrong in your life? Uh, no. No, very good. Well, I have a feeling someday that may happen. You may end up wanting to do something that you really shouldn't do. And one of the best things that you can do is rely on Jesus, rely on God to try and keep you from doing that, okay? So just remember, sometime when you are about, uh, I guess you're almost gone too, but I think the best thing to do is to call on God and say, God, give me strength to be able to stay away from doing what's bad. Sound good? Because none of us want to have to eat a rock, right? Okay. Thanks, Aiden, for coming up. Appreciate it. And if you want to, you can head upstairs and be with Miss Shelley. Thanks. Okay. I got to make sure that that rock doesn't fall on my foot during the rest of the service. So during the, the season of Lent, um, every other year, I like to do what are called Lenten learnings. And these are just short, short um, things that let you know a little bit more about this very important season in the Christian year. 
So the first of these is the meaning of Lent. Now some of you have probably grown up with Lent and know everything there is about this season, but there are all probably some who are new to, to this season, and so that is why we talk about these things. Lent is a church season of 40 consecutive days, not including the Sundays, and it begins on Ash Wednesday and ends at 11.59 p.m. on Holy Saturday. It's the season of preparing oneself for the time of celebrating Easter. Historically, Lent began as only a period of fasting and preparation by converts who were about to be baptized. They were really the only ones who marked Lent. Baptisms were only done on Easter Sunday in the early church. But as the centuries went on, the season became a time of penance and reflection for all Christians. Does anybody know what the word Lent actually means? What, what it stems from? It has nothing really to do with Christianity. The word Lent comes from an Anglo-Saxon word, lengthen, which simply means to lengthen, meaning that as spring comes upon us during Lent, the days are lengthening with more sunlight. So really, the word has no Christian connotation. It comes from the season. Remember that many of our Christian holy days were adapted from already existing pagan festivals, hoping to have the people not eliminate the holy days they already knew, but to assign different, more important Christian meanings to them. And as many people have pondered this in the past, if you count all the days from Ash Wednesday through Holy Saturday, you get 46, not 40. Officially, Christians are not to count the, the six Sundays as part of the Lenten season, because Sunday is always to be considered a little Easter. Thus, we are to remember the risen Christ every Sunday, and we have joy mixed with our soul searching during this season. So that means that if you have given up something for Lent, it is totally up to you whether you use each Sunday as a day off from that sacrifice, since it's not technically Lent, or you just continue it straight through. Only God and you decide that. So hopefully that gives you just a little bit more understanding of our Lenten season. And now I'll invite Mark to come, and she's going to read for us our Old Testament lesson for today. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess and you possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. You shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, Today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord, the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. So now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, have given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God. Then you, together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. Thank you so much. And if you are able, if you'll please stand for our gospel lesson for this day. It comes from Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory, and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, 
and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So if you decided to do something different for Lent this year, either making a sacrifice or adding something positive, I hope that you are still doing pretty well at that. It's only been four days since Ash Wednesday, and I imagine you've had the willpower to go about 100 hours on your new endeavor. I can proudly say that I have not had any desserts since Wednesday, but I have a feeling this is going to be a difficult year for me. Each year I do something like this. I realize how much I tend to stockpile my chocolate. I have two pantries at the parsonage, and whenever I find anything to do with chocolate on clearance, I buy it. Unfortunately, in the frenzy of the after Christmas sales, I usually forget that in about two months' time, I won't be able to eat any of it for a long, long time. So there it sits, just taunting me from the pantry shelves. I wish I could say that giving up something as simple as chocolate isn't a big deal for me, but it is. I really like chocolate. And since I don't smoke, drink, or do drugs, it's a simple, relatively non-harmful pleasure that I enjoy. But I know that Lent is partly about sacrificing something you love in order to put you in better understanding of what Jesus did for us, and also about growing closer to God through the effort that you're making. So will God get mad at me if I do slip up and give in to the chocolatey temptation in the closet? No, he might be a little disappointed, knowing that he did instill me with enough self-control to do it. But really, the season of Lent is meant to draw us closer to God not have us whining all the time about what we can't have, which I have also been prone to do. So instead of giving up dessert, maybe I should just switch my sweet tooth for something else. For those of you who, go, who love going into Chicago, do you ever buy food from street vendors? Anybody like going in and buying street vendor food? Okay, we have at least a couple of people. Okay. Personally, I am not one that buys my cuisine on the street. If I'm going to shell out the money to eat away from home, I want to get the whole thing, food, ambiance, and being waited on. But there are some very interesting and very tasty things that can basically be found only on the street in a good way. In the United States, there aren't a lot of street vendors, street food vendors everywhere, except in large cities. But in other countries, this is a very typical way of getting your food. I remember being in Athens, Greece for the Greek Orthodox Easter one year. Now the Easter dinner that I feasted on was roast lamb. John, can you put up the first picture? There we go. So this lamb is carved from a sheep rotating on a spit out in the middle of the plaza on a sunny 75 degree day. I am really not sure how sanitary that was, but everybody was eating it, so we all dealt with our intestinal issues together. According to travelandleisure.com, a vacation planning website, here are some of the strangest street foods in the world. From Bangkok, Thailand, fried water beetles. They are literally fried in sesame oil and scooped into paper bags. I guess they're considered crispy, crunchy snacks there. Anybody heading out there? 
Okay. Have you ever tried reindeer hot dogs? You can get them from Anchorage, Alaska street vendors. Now, I did eat reindeer when I was in Nome on a mission trip, but not in hot dog form. Now, I have to say, pretty much the rest of these don't really sound like delicacies to me, but so many people tell me that I guess I'm pretty picky when it comes to my food. How would you like stinky tofu from Taipei, Taiwan? And this, have you had that? Oh, okay. But it literally is called stinky tofu. Before it's fried, it's soaked in a rancid broth of fermented vegetables and shrimp that is there up to six months. The concoction is up to six months. There is yak butter tea from Tibet, which is exactly what it sounds like. Then this one I think is the worst one, lava bread from the Gower Peninsula in Wales. Anybody ever have this? Okay. This is lava bread. It's a bread made from a black seaweed that grows on the rocks there. There is bacon shark, not bacon like bacon like we like, but bacon shark from Maracas Bay, Trinidad, which is a sandwich made from fatty black tip shark. And then there's from Octavalo, Ecuador, roasted cuy, which is basically our equivalent of a guinea pig. I chose not to put the picture up there because it does not look very good. If you are interested, look it up on the internet later on today. <laughs> so um, basically on all of these things, I wouldn't want to put these in my mouth, let alone buy them from a cart parked outdoors in the heat and the wind and the bugs all day long. Call me crazy, but believe it or not, there is a purpose to me talking about all this unusual food. When we're hungry, we can be talked into eating something we may have never imagined we would eat. Our defenses are down, and literally our gut instincts take over. I wouldn't doubt that if someone put a chocolate-covered water bug in front of me four weeks from now, I would have to work really hard at ignoring it. Now imagine what Jesus would have been dealing with in his wilderness temptation. He hadn't just given up chocolate for 40 days straight. He hadn't eaten anything for 40 days straight. Doctors say that you can live up to about six weeks without any food, but only three to four days without water. That's why it's so important to get water quickly to areas where disasters strike. Since the human body is made up of almost 60% water, we have to replenish it way more than we do food. Jesus was able to make it to the end of his fast, but here's a question. Why do you think Jesus, the Son of God, decided to fast for that long? He certainly didn't need to grow closer to God. He was God. Well, my understanding is that he did this to concentrate on the start of his ministry, what would be three years of gaining disciples and teaching people the true ways of our Lord. When we fast, when we give up something important to us, it's important that we forego what we want in order to focus on what serves God best. Again, the most important thing isn't what we do, it's why we do it and what we gain from it. Jesus was able to lay claim to and plan out what he needed to do during this time, and it worked, even when temptation came uncalling. Here's another thing to remember when temptations arise in our lives, that temptation in and of itself is not a sin. Every single one of us will be tempted, even Jesus was. It says it right in the Bible. And we understand Jesus to be the only person to ever live without sinning. So if just being tempted with a sin, if being tempted was a sin, Jesus couldn't be called sinless, could he? No, having temptations attack you is to be expected. Should you intentionally put yourself in places where temptations are likely to pop up? No, Jesus didn't do that. And neither should any of us who have much worse track records than him. A father told his son not to go swimming. The father later caught him swimming. 
But I didn't mean to go swimming, pleaded the boy. So why did you bring your bathing suit, the father asked. Oh, replied the boy, I brought it along just in case I was tempted. Well, I can guarantee you, you are going to be tempted. So don't consider yourself bad just because you're tempted. It simply means you're human. But do know that being tempted often leads to other problems, including sin. It is a tool of evil, and it will be used over and over again. If it was used on the Son of God, it'll be used on you and me. The goal of temptation is to pull us off the mission of living a God-centered life that is helpful to both you and those you impact. So Satan will use any method of temptation possible. The first one he used on Jesus was physical food. At the end of 40 days without food, you have to believe that Jesus was probably thinking about food and how his powers could possibly gain it. Now, he could have turned a rock into bread and saved his stomach from additional pains. But Jesus knew we can't be fully fed simply by filling our stomachs. We have to listen to what God has to say as well, then follow it. And to him, that was much more important than getting just momentary satisfaction. He would get around to eating very shortly, and because that was a necessity for him as well. But he wouldn't let Satan have the satisfaction of tempting him away from what God wanted. What is also interesting about the temptation of Jesus is that evil works its ways in several different ways here, just as it does with us. Not only is our Lord made to think of bread and how much he needs it, but Jesus' ego is appealed to here as well. In the Greek that this was written in, a better translation of each command that Satan gives is, because you are the Son of God not if you are the Son of God. Satan here is goading Jesus into showing off his skills because he is the Son of God. He can turn the bread, rock into bread, and he needs it, so why doesn't he just impress his adversary while tending to his stomach at the same time? What could be the harm in that? Except that Jesus knows that Satan only wants to trap him not see a show or have his needs met. We need to watch this as well. Sometimes our temptations come in ways that are natural, our hungers, our loves, even our ministries. At times, evil will tell us to prove we have the skills we already know we have. But in those cases, they won't be used to help anyone but ourselves. And that's not why God gave them. My hope is that when we're tempted to do something that simply proves who we were created to be, we'll think before we act and see if what we're doing is really for God's glory or if we're doing it just for ourselves. That's another great reason we study the Bible, whether in our homes or in church. God gave us the holy book to instruct us, to help us live our lives better. Even though the words in this book are at minimum 1,900 years old, it's amazing how timely they are. That's because God knows all about our human situation. We really haven't changed too much in essence in humanity's time on this earth. And what we need and how we relate to each other and God is timeless. In reality, studying God's word isn't meant to turn you into a Bible geek. Learning what is truth and what are lies, staying on the mission you and God intended, keeping away from sin, these are all benefits of taking the time to read what God has said is important for centuries on end. And this unchanging word gives us something to hold on to when life around us seems to struggle and sway. We find strength in God's words if we choose to believe they have meaning for our life. Jesus did, and he accomplished quite a bit in his life. But in addition to God's word, we have another way to fight against the temptations in our life, 
and that is Jesus himself. We are thankful to have forgiveness offered to us every day because we need it. We face temptation, and despite our best intentions, we still fall down, having succumbed to its enticements. Jesus didn't. When presented with three of the biggest temptations anyone could face, he didn't budge. He didn't move. He didn't falter in the least. How could he do that? Well, the easiest answer is that Jesus was also God. He had a bit more power than we do. But the best answer is that he did it for us. In reality, what would have happened if he had given in? He would have eaten his fill. He would have achieved global power, which he already knew eventually he would get. He would have impressed the devil with a multitude of angels forming a supernatural rescue net. None of it horrible. None of it beyond what the God of the entire universe could accomplish. But Jesus chose not to do it because this gave someone for us to put our faith in. It provided us with a rock to lean on when we are tempted. When we're being pushed and pulled in the direction of sin, we can cry out to the Lord saying, I've fallen in the past and I just might do it again. But God, I know you are greater than I am. Help me with your power to resist this temptation. And no matter what happens, help me realize that I can be forgiven and set back on the path to wholeness as long as I repent and try hard not to repeat the mistake. We can then be assured that there is power, there is mercy, there is grace, enough for us all to fight against the evils of this world. Temptation is something we all face. If even Jesus had it forced upon him, we can't expect to escape its troubles. But we can do something about temptation because we've been given the tools. Paul Harvey, the famous radio broadcaster, once told what I think is the best illustration of what temptation can do for us. Can do to us, I'm sorry. If Eskimos need to kill a wolf, they simply coat several layers of blood onto a sharp knife sticking out of the frozen tundra. The wolf will pick up the scent, and after circling the knife warily, it'll begin licking the frozen blood. It will lick faster and faster as the desire for blood literally drives the wolf mad. So great becomes the craving that the wolf never notices the sting of the sharp blade on its own tongue as the blood becomes its own. While we as humans don't necessarily want to give in to temptation, at times the scent of it is just too delicious. So we try just a little bit of it, not intending to have it take control. But the taste can be too much, and we dig in, unaware of how much it's hurting us in the process, unaware of the consequences being meted out as a result. But unlike the wolf, we can help ourselves. We have God's word and God's son to lean on when those temptations become great. Do that, and you'll never know how much power you just might have to fight temptation. Amen. And now we will sing our middle song this week. It is number 269. Um, Lord, who throughout these 40 days will sing the first two verses of this song.
And now we will hear our joys and concerns for this day. We want to lift up the Kenny family. Um, Julie is dealing with a very swollen knee. Is it any better, or Maggie, have they come up with anything? Okay. The swelling has gone down some, but she's going to be getting an MRI to try and figure out what needs to be done. And we also lift up Bill Kenny's dad as he's dealing with a number of health issues at this time. We continue to lift up Susanna Tournier. She is recovering from her knee replacement surgery. Um, she is in a, um, a rehab facility in Mendota, and it's coming along, but it hurts. <laughs> and so I know she'd appreciate your prayers to get through that. We lift up Polly Lawson, who's Larry Lawson's mother. Um, she is back at Country Comfort now, but having lots of health issues. So we lift up Polly. Before I left, I didn't have a good chance to lift up um, a congratulations to both the, the boys and the girls um, basketball teams for Princeton High School. The girls won the conference tournament, and I'm sorry, they won the conference this year, and the boys, of course, won the regional, so congratulations to all of them, and, and not just the players, but the cheerleaders, um, the, the pep band, and all those who support. We lift up Carol Bird's mother, who is dealing with failing health down in Georgia. We also have a lot of traveling mercies that need to go out. The Merce, the Birds, the, the Wendells, and numerous others are going to be traveling in the weeks ahead, so we pray for them. We lift up Chris Ruzinski, our, the one who normally um, staffs the nursery. She has had the flu now for a couple of weeks and is getting very impatient in her recovery. So she asks us to pray not only for healing and for that, but also to pray for patience for her if possible. We also lift up the family of Cleona Gross. I am going to be doing her funeral at Norberg's on Monday. We lift up a joy um, from Marsha and Bob Hudson. They have a new baby in the family. Abby Mills had a boy this past week, Lucas David Jeremy, so they are excited about that. We also want to say, uh, he had to leave for a quick second, but Jackson was here for the first time in our, um, in our worship service, so we're very glad to have him here. And he will be baptized on the last Sunday in March, um, so we are looking forward to that. We continue to pray for all those who have cancer, and we, of course, lift up the situation in Ukraine and pray for the best possible outcome, and we, of course, pray for peace. So at this time, let us bow our heads um, for my pastoral prayer, then we'll say our Lord's Prayer together. Creative, passionate God, you have shaped our world in beauty and harmony. You then invite us to participate in the balance of creation. We grow in wisdom as our experience unfolds. We learn from our many situations, yet we too often find our well-meant actions leading to unintended consequences. Too often we give in to temptation that disrupts the order of the world you would prefer. We can't undo all our mistakes but we can turn once more to the living presence of Jesus and find new ways to live and to love ourselves, each other, and you. Lord, don't let our hearts be fearful, but let us now, in just a short moment of silence, acknowledge our sins and seek the forgiveness that restores your peace in us and in the world. Lord, we ask for your presence and your blessing to be upon each of the difficulties and concerns we've brought before you this day. Each one is important, and we know you can do so much to help these situations. We place them in your hands and ask that you encourage us to use our gifts and talents in helping positive results to come. It is in our Savior's name and power that we make these requests, and now we share the prayer that he taught us to pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And as always, we want to say thank you for the the gifts that you give to our church so that we continue our missions in our community and around the world. So thank you. And for those who are in the sanctuary, of course, you can put any tithes or offerings into the plates at the exits of the sanctuary. For those who are at home, you are welcome to give through PayPal, mail it into the office, or put it in the locked white box outside the main doors. If you'll please bow your heads with me for our offering prayer, and then as you're able, stand and we'll sing our doxology together. From the abundance you've provided us, we offer the best we can, Lord. Guide our use of this money, that it will be spent in ways you approve. Through Christ we pray. Amen. standing for our short liturgy for Holy Communion. There we go. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. You may be seated. So it is the first Sunday in Lent, a season that I have to admit is not my favorite because there is so much sacrifice that goes on in it, but we know that that sacrifice leads to a wonderful outcome, and of course that is the joy of Easter. I think that it is important in any situation that we go through some difficulty to truly appreciate the good that can come out of things. If we only had good all the time, we wouldn't understand how truly good it is. So let us be willing to sacrifice some in this season to be able to come out into the joy on the other side. And one of those ways in which we can do that is to remember what Jesus did for us. We, of course, will remember that most importantly during Holy Week. But we also take this time, as we do every month, to remember what he did for us that last meal that he shared with his disciples. We remember that on the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, he lifted it up to heaven, gave thanks to his Father for it, and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the evening meal was completed, Jesus took the cup. He lifted that to heaven as well, gave thanks to his Father for it. He poured it out. He gave it to his friends and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this as often as you can, in remembrance of me. If you'll please bow your heads with me for the prayer of consecration. Most loving God, we are grateful that you provide us the opportunity to know your love, your grace, your power in a time such like this. We are grateful that you always provide us what we need. And sometimes we need Holy Communion to be able to give us the spiritual energy that only you can provide. As we continue this journey through Lent toward the cross and eventually the empty tomb, allow us to be able to feel your love and your blessing in our lives despite the sacrifices and difficulties we go through. 
And Lord, send your Holy Spirit to be upon these elements, upon the wheat of the field and the fruit of the vine, that they may be for us a true representation of your body and blood given for each one of us. It is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. In the United Methodist Church, the communion table is open to anyone who has or seeks a relationship with God. We are going to um, have JD and Marg and Liz come forward, and we will have our gloves on and our masks, and we will have two stations, um, Mar uh, JD and Liz on this side and Marg and I on this side. We will um, be handing you the pieces of bread and then handing you the cup of grape juice. If you would prefer one of the, the individual um, pre-packaged um, sets, communion packs, you're welcome to come to the table and pick one of those. Um, if you will come to the inside of the aisles, um, these side aisles, and then return to your seats by either the middle aisle or the, the side aisles, we would appreciate you doing that. Those in the, in the balcony can choose whichever one you'd like to come down to. Um, and then when you're done with the plastic cups, if you would put them in the glass bowls that are located on the stools on either side of the altar. The communion table is now open for all who choose to partake of it.
If you'll please bow your heads with me for the prayer following communion. Your love, O God, knows no bounds. We have gathered here neighbor and stranger, friend and foe, young and older. Where we may be divided, your love makes us one. So let us rise from this table and walk forward in the light of Christ together. Amen. And now, as you are able, if you will stand and sing our closing song together, number 397. I'm still going. There we go. The first, second, and fourth verses of I Need Thee Every Hour. Thank you to everyone who helped out this um, this day. We had Bruce back at the sound. Uh, John and Maggie were helping with PowerPoint. Josh is on the live cast. And Ben, I think, was helping back there, too. Um, let's see. Marg was the liturgist, and Marg and JD and Liz on the on communion. Charlie, of course, played wonderfully, as always. And I do have to lift up that we we never think about all the things that have to go and behind, on behind the scenes. Liz Friend comes every Saturday and puts together the communion elements, so we really appreciate her, her doing that as well. If you'll please now join me in our unison benediction and Irish blessing. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind blow softly at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. May the rain fall softly on your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hands. Go in the peace, love, and joy of our Lord. Amen.